Okay. Um, hi! <laughs> Hello! Hello, everybody! Uh, Gail, live from foreign climes, shall we say. Uh, all 45 minutes away from my normal location. Uh, I set this to officially go live at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, so I'm not even sure if I'm talking into the void or not. Um, so... Yeah, I think I'm talking into the void. No, it it says there are people watching. So maybe, <laughs> will somebody please leave a comment? Will somebody say hi to me so I know what's going on? Oh, Lisa, hi. Okay, all right. Hi, everybody. So what's happening is normally, hello, sweethearts. Hi, Karen, <laughs> nice to see you again. Um. For those of you who don't who aren't familiar with me being live, let's be fair, you're probably all familiar with me being live. Normally I do this on my phone, which actually is easier. Uh, comments do seem to be delayed. Yes, that's actually normal. Um, anyway, I normally do this from my phone, but for various reasons, not the least of which is I have no means to hold my phone up in the appropriate way. Uh, I'm actually doing this on my computer, which is very weird and different for me. Everything is laid out in different places and ways and seeing the comments is strange and anyway hi so that's why this looks weird this is an actual backdrop this is not a zoom fake background this is my new teeny tiny bedroom uh at my dad's place um it is newly relocated location and so I am I am broadcasting from the wilds of not my office <laughs> for a change, which means everything's out of order and I'm discombobulated. So this is going to be quite a ridiculous live. I hope you are ready to ask silly questions. Thank you. I'm, I'm doing I went with clashing leopard print today because, you know, you do what you can. Um, Tell me where you're all tuning in for, from. Some of you have already said, you know I love seeing it. Um, hi, Ryan. Oh my God, some old, old familiar faces out there. Um, Jake has posted it to the group. Thank you, darling. Um, bonjour. Uh, it's going to be silly. It's going to be silly because uh, I have nothing planned. And when I don't have anything planned, I get very weird. So you have all been warned. It's kind of open season on Gail's slightly scattered brain because it's been a hell of a start to this year, everybody, and things are only just ironing out a little bit. Um, but I just haven't haven't collected myself back together again. Um, so there it is. Um, right. So um, there's a heat wave going on. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry for everybody who has a heat wave. It's quite pleasant here. I'd open the window, but then I get backlit, backlit and then it just becomes a thing. Also, it's a tiny, silly little window. Before we start, uh, the only thing I'm going to mention is that I am wearing a lip crayon today. I love the lip crayon because you can get very precise, but it doesn't stay on as well as the Colorstay lipsticks do, but it's still pretty good. Uh, this is a Revlon Colorstay lip crayon. Um, and they only have like two red, reds in their lip color stay lip crayon online. And this is one of them. This is the orangier one, I think. <laughs> then there's a bluer, cooler toned one. This is the warmer toned one. So there you go. That's what I'm wearing. These are from Vooglam. Um, I love them, but I mostly wear pair I wear now, but these are an old pair from Vooglam. They happen to be the pair that I have in my purse. So <laughs> that's why I'm wearing them. Like I said, very, very scattered today, everyone. Um, my audio is being subtitled. Oh, yes, this is going to be an exciting adventure in Facebook technology because I have, I almost never do uh, live broadcasts using my proper computer. So it probably will actually be a little bit better than the mobile, but mostly I didn't do it on the computer because the tech from Facebook is way worse on the computer, but it seems like they've improved things a little bit. I can read all of your comments. That's a bonus. Have I tried vinyl by Maybelline? I have. I find the vinyl, ooh, we're gonna have, apparently we're having makeup talk out the gate, wonderful. I find the vinyl line a little too sticky for me. It just takes a little while to, oh, 
See, you say it's your favorite non-moving mat, but um, I find it too sticky, so I don't know. I uh, I have a whole blog post, incidentally, about my love of makeup, and all the makeup is there. If you want Gail Carragher makeup, then you'll get it. But um, but I talk about the fact that I have incredibly dry skin, including lips, and that just means makeup behaves differently on me than it does on a lot of other people. So, um. Oh, June, I'm sorry we missed each other in Tucson. For I just had two events this last month. I was in Tucson in Arizona for a steampunk event, Wild Wild West Con, which was a real blast. It was a lot of fun. It was real old school. You know, I, I've been in the steampunk mo movement for 15 years now, and some of the people who were at this event I met over a decade ago in steampunk. So it's like kind of a reunion. It was really fun. And then prior to that, I was in Colorado teaching at Superstars. And um, that was wonderful. And for those of you who read The Cherub, you know what happened to me in between those two events, which was unpleasantness. But we won't talk about that. Um, oh my gosh, everybody is tuning in from all over the place. We have uh, the UK and Wales and Australia. It must be the middle of the night for some of you. Um, uh, Kaya is saying that the pictures from the steampunk event were great. Yes, I did a coordinated cosplay outfit with two of my friends, which frankly I haven't done since I was a wee little cosplayer teenager. Um, so that was fun. We did a steampunk uh, Star Trek and I did I did a command uniform, which yes, means I was the red shirt, but red is my color. Uh, I, although I, I, you know, I identify a little bit closer with science officer. I am very bossy, so perhaps I should be in command color anyway. But yeah, I just like the color red the best. So that's why I chose the red uniform. So everybody remember, I, I don't have anything structured for today. We're just going to have fun and chat. Uh, so please remember just to put a question mark at the beginning of your comment if um if you want me to talk to you. Otherwise, enjoy leaving comments. I will see most of them. I do go back and read them, and you can also chat with each other. That's always cool. But it looks like we have just one little question happening out the gate, and it's from S.H. Klein. Am I feeling better? Yes. I'm feeling mostly up to my... I'm feeling a little brain foggy still, but um, I think that's just a lot of travel all of a sudden. And, uh, you know, and the, the results of moves and the, the chaos that has been. Um, but physically, yes, I'm feeling way better. Um, it was not COVID. I tested multiple times. Either it didn't test positive or it wasn't COVID. Uh, it was just your standard bad cold. Um, and I, you know, as you get older, you're, you're less able to, sh you know, throw this stuff off, you know, and now when I get sick, I get sick for a while. I used to, you know, get sick for a day or two and then bounce right back and be totally over it and back up and running. And now I'm like, no, I'm, I'm down for the count. And you know what? I'm just going to wallow in it and I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to watch some, you know, K-dramas and trashy TV and, and let myself recover and drink a lot of juice and eat a lot of soup. Um, no red shirt for Miss Gale. Eh, you know, I never wanted to be a perma player on a on a enduring, you know, seven year long television series. I'd always rather just a guest bit and then die and then everybody can cry and mourn my loss. Uh, can you tell Kayla was one of my favorite characters? Um, do, 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 do. Question from Pam. Wait, I had, Robin. Robin has a question. Of course, Robin has a question. Hello, darling. Um, Robin wants to know. No. Sorry, we're having some mouse issues with the speed of the comments. You guys are always so chatty. It's marvelous. Hello from Canada. Red shirt. Sorry, scanning through. Robin says, um, what's the greatest a moment of the wedding? Oh, my God. It was so good. Okay, so I have to tell this story because it's so good. And I don't know if Charity is here. So uh, this is our opportunity to talk behind Charity's back. <laughs> anyway, um so there was a wedding at wild wild west con which was one of the reasons i accepted the invitation this year because i had been back i had been there just a couple of years ago and i don't usually go to the same convention too frequently i don't want to wear out my welcome 
So, um, but I accepted the invitation because I knew that on Saturday there was going to be a big wedding that the con had basically just been like, well, we know everybody who's at the con is pretty much going to attend to this wedding anyway. So we'll just make it part of the con. So it just became the Saturday party was this wonderful wedding. Um, and there were many people who were in the audience who were like, yeah, we don't know the brides, but we're going to attend anyway. But the reason I was very excited to go is that Charity and Evie, who were the two people getting married, are both fans. So Evie is one of the first cosplayers of my books that I ever met many, many years ago. And Evie was cosplaying Tunstall. Um, I think it was at San Diego Com San Diego um, uh, Gas Lamp, Gas Lamp, Gas the steampunk event that's down in San Diego the first time I went. Uh, Evie was there cosplaying Tunstall. It was great. It was such an amazing outfit. I, I'm sure you've seen pictures. I, I'm always reposting those pictures because they're so good. Um, and then Charity is one of you. So Charity came in as a fan, mostly via online and via the group and stuff like that here on Facebook. Um, just a big reader fan of my books. And then Charity met me at a regular science fiction fantasy kind of convention-y thing um, on the other side of the United States, up in Michigan or something like that. Anyway, and the, completely desperately, like I met these, these two lovely women completely separate <laughs> from each other. But through the course of fandom and for various other reasons, and because Charity via me became a big fan of Madame Askew and the Grand Arbiter and the Temporal Entourage, who are like a performer cosplayer contingent, Evie is one of them. Charity and Evie eventually met, and then they eventually met in person, and then they fell in love, and now they're getting married. Or they got married. They're now officially married. And so, yeah, I got to go to a wedding of my people, like my fans. I feel like I'm entirely responsible for this relationship. <laughs> um, you know, the things we do good in this world, one of them is to help people find true love. I mean, yay! How cool is that? So, yes, this wedding was great. I The wedding's color theme which should tell you everything you need to know are bright pink and butter lemon yellow <laughs> so I was like well I'll be wearing pink so I pulled out a, a old pink dress that I haven't worn in ages um, I had a lovely date who was also wearing pink everybody was fabulously dressed of course it was a steampunk party and so my favorite part was I didn't participate in the ceremony um, but I did get to walk through the archway to announce the brides to the reception after, you know, the cakes had come out and everything. And, uh, and that archway was made of parasols. So I got to go through and say, ladies and gentlemen, the brides, and then the brides came through and it was just, oh, it was so cute. <laughs> anyway, you can tell. I had a wonderful time. Uh, the cake was really good. Very important for me, of course, that the food be good. In this case, the cake. There were multiple cakes. I swear, there were at least 10 cakes. <laughs> That's what they went with. 10 cakes of different flavors, which pretty ingenious, quite frankly. Um, and they actually had people help decorate people at the con because it's full of a bunch of creative types help decorate the cakes. It was it was so cute. It was such a community effort. Um, and the cakes were delicious. My favorite was the one that had the lemon curd. It was a lemon with lemon curd, like in between, and then a meringue lemony frosting. It was just like all lemon all day long. I'm a lemon drizzle girl in general. So I love a lemony sour cake. So yeah, so the walking to the archway was a highlight for me. Although, you know, I'm a terrible sap. So I cried terribly uh, during the ceremony, which was, a pleasingly short ceremony. Uh, I did cry, um, but my eyeliner did not run. So chalk what up for Tower 28, <laughs> just the new eyeliner I've been wearing. Um, so yeah, all in all, it was a it was a really really fun event, and I was very honored to get to be there. Um, yeah, it's a good time. All right, looking through questions, I think yes, Pam has the next question. What was my original inspiration for the Parasol Protectorate series? Oh, we've gone from the present day state of the steampunk world to the Wayback Machine. Well, I suppose it's steampunk. <laughs> we can always have a Wayback Machine. It's a part of its meta. Um, so yeah, I it was it was multifaceted inspiration. This is one thing I always advise authors is when you're coming up with the idea for a thing, note down how you came up with it because 
if it becomes famous or you become very well known for it, people will ask you because I don't quite remember the exact sequence of events. But essentially, I didn't really know steampunk existed as a movement, as a like aesthetic, a participatory movement. Um, so we'll put that aside. So as a writer in my little ivory tower of a lone writerness, I was thinking about a lot of things that had been going on in the writing industry at the time, which is the late 90s, early 2000s, which included the paranormal romance and urban fantasy bubble was happening at the time, which turned out not to be a bubble because we're still writing that and we're still reading that. But at the time, we thought it was a bubble. And I was reading a lot of urban fantasy and I was really enjoying it. But for me, it was kind of really gritty and dark. Um, and then I also read a lot of historicals, historical romances and things like that. And I also really enjoy comedy. And so I was doing a sort of intellectual thing where I was thinking, you know, it would be really fun to have urban fantasy, but in the past. And it would also be really good if that were funny and a little bit more lighthearted and less serious rapey than a lot of the urban fantasy at the time so i basically was like okay i feel like i need to write this thing if you spot a problem or <laughs> you're responsible for a solution and so that's what i did and as i was writing it i was doing a sort of intellectual exercise about um, the victorian era and science and what if you took the monsters that the victorians wrote of in the gothics at the time and made them integrated and real in sea society so there's no like hidden hidden monstrosity that's all out in the open how would the victorians react to that how would the scientists of the time period react to ha that and how would technology change as a result of the presence of myth myth creatures real monstrosities and creatures amongst them because this is also kind of there's a lot of stuff that's going on in the literature of the time period like you know, the Gothics are grappling with concepts of monstrosity themselves and uh, the idea um, that humans are responsible for our own agency. So this idea that we transition from the devil and the uh, religious belief of what is evil into that humans create our own evil, that our own experimentation with technology, something like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Um, so the result evil is the result of mankind's own hubris. Um, that is a very kind of interesting scientific concept uh, to grapple with that is being birthed during this time period as well. So I did a lot of things that all seemed to gel by setting these books in this time period. And the very, very short answer to your question is, in my case, Victorian werewolves and vampires had steampunk consequences. And then I started writing these books and they had this very strong steampunk aesthetic and I didn't even really know what steampunk was. And then I looked around and sort of woke up and I was like, ah, I'm writing steampunk. There's a thing and I'm writing it. Um, so that is how the original uh, plan came into being. All right, Scott asks, am I going to visit the UK anytime soon? Many years ago at the Nottingham Waterstones. Does the Scott, does the Nottingham Waterstones still exist? Because the answer to your question is maybe. Uh, so Worldcon is in Glasgow this year, and I would really like to go, but I never attend um, any of the larger cons if I'm not put on the programming. So write to them and tell them to put me on programming, because if I'm on the programming, then I can tax deduct everything. <laughs> uh, I know. Um, but then I'm official and I can be there. And yeah, and I it, it, it's just easier every all the ways around to um, to justify a very expensive trip to the UK if I'm on a program of a convention. Just saying. So if Worldcon ever decides to get back to me and tell me whether I am on the program, if I am on the program, I will be going to Glasgow. And then this is me, so I'll probably bum around Scotland for a little while um, unofficially. I'll just do a little, you know, vacation-y thing, um, see some friends. And um, one of my besties from college wants to go around Scotland, and I was like, great, let's do that. And then I will go down to the, down the UK. Uh, so I went to school in Nottingham. I will definitely go to Nottingham if it's the same Waterstones and their game. I will absolutely try to organize an event there. Uh, obviously, I love Nottingham. I lived there for years. I have many, many good friends in the area. So even if it's an informal thing, I'll try to organize something in Knott's. Uh, it would be easier if it happens at a at a bookstore. But 
so I will do something in knots and then if at all possible, I'll try to do something maybe even in London, even if it's again, even if it's just an informal gathering, because I'll probably go all the way down. My family's all in the south. They're in Oxford, Exeter and London. Um, so I'll try to I'll probably try to just take it as an opportunity to really see family. To be frank, everybody, I don't have that much family left, so I got to see the ones I got while we're all still around. So, yeah, and it has been like you said, that was the last Scott, that was the last time I was in the UK um, or that was the last time I was in England. I've been back to Scotland, I've been to Scotland and to Ireland, but um, but not to England anyway. So, yeah. Um, I really do want to try to do a trip this year um, to that part of the world, but I can't commit until I know whether I'm going to be on that. It's all going to ride on programming. Um, so that's where we are on coming. Yes, but I want to go back. I, I do. I also want to write some more on the parasol verse and I need to kind of like go back and travel to that part of the world to get inspired in part. So I need to I need to visit 2016. Wow, that was a long time ago. Okay, so I was in London in 2019, I feel like, for London. I was there for London Worldcon, whenever that was, because I accepted an award for Patrick. So I got to walk around having not earned, but still holding a Hugo Award, uh, which let me tell you is the best way <laughs> to have a relationship with the Hugo Awards, because there's no stress whatsoever. It's somebody else's award, but everybody comes up to me and wants to congratulate me and talk to me. And I'm like, well, it's not mine, but thanks. <laughs> Um, uh, how do these captions work? Uh, somebody is asking about the captions. I can't see them. I believe they're being automatically generated. I've never had captions before. I think it's something that Facebook only does for, um, lives that are done via a computer, which I'm, which I'm doing it now for the first time in years. So. Uh, but yeah, if the captions are good, I'm excited for everything. Uh, I'm going to make it, I make it pretty difficult on captions because I use weird long words and I have a intermediary accent. All right. I think that we're moving on to the next question. Uh, Rune asks, speaking of K-dramas, have I watched Hotel de Luna? Of course. Of course. It's amazing. It is very good. Yeah. Is that the one that has Sanjay in it? Anyway, it's very good. Um, yes, I've watched many. I've watched far too many K-dramas, um, um, but um, Hotel de la Luna is, is excellent. I'm not very good on the current ones. I haven't really caught up. Um, I know there are a couple of airing that, that my fellow K-drama fans have told me I should be watching and I am not caught up on them. All right, I'm scrolling through to see the next question, but it it looks like Fran. Oh my goodness, Jude! Like everybody's here. This is so great. Um, it looks like I don't have another question. So should I ab lib do a little dance? Um, yeah. So everybody who's tuning in uh, now or later, this is a little glimpse of what my dad's place looked like. For those of you who followed the saga in <laughs> the cheer up, I had to move my 90 year old father very unexpectedly at the end of the year, and um, now he is in a nice little. I think it's a very nice little mobile home. It's a it's a 1971 um, double wide, <laughs> but it's it's quite cute. And it has had, I don't think it has very much done to it since 1971. It has the original Lucite towel holders in the bathrooms and stuff like that, the original paneling. Um, but he's settling in quite comfortably. And I had to come up here to meet with a possible house cleaner yesterday because I, I need somebody to check up on him and, and also clean up the place a little bit. And um, and so I'm up here because I had a meeting this morning and I didn't have time to drive down. So you are getting, and the internet is actually better here than it is at my house or my office. So I figured, what what the hey, I'll just do it here. So this is this is what my tiny room looks like. It's just a little, oh, oh, just a, a little, a little twin bed and I got myself a nice mattress. <laughs> Um, does Timeless have a musical soundtrack? Oh, that's interesting. So um, I've I've had this question in the past, but it's been a while where people always ask me if I listen to music or if I have song lists and stuff for inspiration. And the answer is most of the time, no. And then 
stuff changed during the pandemic and I I was and I was hunting for music that I could listen to that that I enjoyed that's kind of my stylish but that didn't distract me from writing and that's kind of when I found K-pop. So and then I wrote an entire book series kind of about the music industry as a result of that. But those are actually the first books that have solid sound soundtracks to the books so timeless is too long ago and even if i did one for timeless it'd be all like classical music and stuff like that um because that's the kind of stuff i listen to when i'm writing parasolvers um i think maybe a couple of the san andreas books might the san andreas shifter books might have some some like soundtrack basically but in general i don't have a ton of them some of them but but not a ton but debbie the, s timeless does not it should but it does not. There'd be some like Paris combo in there or something like that, you know, kind of circusy sort of fun music. Oh, this is, this is, these are difficult to navigate these comments. Um, am I gonna do another fifth gender book? I have a really good idea and a solid concept and um, I'm very excited to write another fifth gender book. Um, Tris and Dre would be in it, but it wouldn't be necessarily about them. Um, it might feature a different main couple or something like that, but they'll be there investigating and there would be a murder. Um, I would actually, you know, kill a very unlikable character and then see who did it. Um, so yeah, I have a, I have a very good idea for another fifth gender book. Um, but right now I need to finish a San Andreas book and then I have some nonfiction I want to do. And then I really want to do a Parasolvers book of some kind. And then I'll turn my attention back to the sci-fi. The sci-fi universe got three books. So it's gotta, it's gotta wait its turn. Um, unless of course I'm like really hit with sudden, um, inspiration and it, ha it has to be written, which doesn't happen to me very often, but it does happen sometimes. Um, hooray for fast internet, says Rachel. Yes, I'm very, I'm personally very excited about it. Um, well, for those of you who don't know, the Bay Area has, being the origin of Silicon Valley and all that, fall de uh, has notoriously bad internet. It's just, it's just, I don't know. It's just the, the price we pay for one of the many prices we pay for existing in this part of the world. So yeah, the internet's pretty terrible almost always. Um, was it 2014 for the Hugo Worldcon? That seems like a very long time ago, but my entire career, which is over a decade now, just runs together in my head. So I don't know, maybe, maybe it was 2014. Maybe it's 2018. Um, uh, Pam wants to know if Michael Sheen would make a great Lord Akeldama. Hmm, interesting casting. Um, I can see that. I, I mean, what can Michael Sheen not do? He's been a werewolf in the past, like, right? He's, he's, he's great. Um, you know, I, no, I haven't met him in person. Sometimes I've met famous people in person and I'm like, oh, right, I met that person. I haven't met Michael Sheen. I imagine he'd be very nice though. Um, what books have I enjoyed lately? Well, I picked up that Elizabeth Bear book, but I haven't started it yet. What did I just finish? Well, I obviously didn't enjoy it if I can't remember it. Um, I've been on a manga kick recently. For those of you who are part of the newsletter, you will know this because um, I, I will put the recommend, recommendation of things I'm picking up and things I'm reading. Um, so yeah, I've been mostly reading a lot of graphic novels recently. Um, and still the favorite one that I've read recently has been um, Old Fashioned Cupcake. I just, it's just such a good, it's such a good manga. It's great. Um, Uh, does the wicker chicken actually retire? Oh, this is a question. This is, oh, we're getting, we're getting character questions. Uh, okay. Oh my gosh. So many questions. Questions are coming thick and fast. Uh, sorry, everybody. Okay. Does the wicker chicken actually retire when a certain individual joins the Scottish pack? Um, would she ever retire? Do we ever retire? I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, my guess would be no, but I don't know for sure. Uh, the answer is she retires if I need her to retire, and she doesn't retire <laughs> if I don't need her to, as the goddess of my universe. Um, will there ever be a Tinkered Star Song cookbook with Vex's recipes? <laughs> oh my god, that would be so much fun. I could make up everything. Um, <laughs> they would all be very colorful 
there would be colorful, crazy dishes. Um, no, I will. I love that idea. That would be a blast. But uh, frankly, I have fiction to write, and and I also have nonfiction to write, which is not that. But I'm not against it. Uh, there was a brief lived dabbling with a cookbook for the Parasolvers with Victorian recipes and stuff, but that went nowhere um, because I outsourced, and uh, as is often the case when one outsourced they proved highly unreliable and then disappeared off the face of the planet so um yeah i love the idea of cookbooks i think it'd be really fun i like the idea of craft books too i think it would be fun to have like knitting patterns and stuff like that all tied into the universe i have I'm endless ideas of things i could do everybody <clears throat> uh, say uh sally say hi to matthew for me uh lynn asks do you know when, oh, uh, Lynn is parroting back some questions for me. Thank you. How very helpful of you. Um, do I know when the Dome 6 audiobook is coming out? Um, soon? <laughs> Sometime in the not too dis within the next two months? <laughs> um, yeah, soon. It's happening. It's happening. I have the assets, the recording's happening. Things are going along, um, so don't worry. But... My goodness, I can't believe you've gotten through the first two that quickly. That's a lot of listening you've managed um, already. Uh, are there books coming out this year? If I can finish the San Andreas book, I will try to pull it out at this year. Yes. Um, but I'm not making any promises. My life keeps exploding. Um, but yes, it will be a, if it's anything, it's the San Andreas book because the San Andreas book is halfway written already. So I just have to finish the darn thing and then put it through the editing process. Part of the problem is I no longer have a developmental editor. So finding a new developmental editor is part of it. I might not with this book. I know, but I always do, but I, I might not with this book because it's the fourth one in a series. So it's a lot of established characters and things. It's a juicy book, though. It's going to be really, really good. Um, but yeah, if I bring out anything, it will be that one. Do I have any favorite Celtic music? Do the Decemberists count? Um, I was, so I was in the Ren Faire for years, and sort of, I'm just, I don't know. I, I guess I'm not a huge Celtic music fan. Um, perhaps I haven't had the right exposure. Uh, but yeah, um, so I don't, I don't have one to name. Um... And I have, and have I found the Groundhog musical on TikTok? <sighs> no. People send me TikTok things to look at, and occasionally I look at them, but I don't know about TikTok. I know, I know, but I am old. Um, so I am legitimately allowed to be skeptical of this place where the young people are. Um, I just have reservations around it. I find it, if I get too into it, it gets a little too addicting, and I don't like that. That makes me nervous. So I haven't really spent a ton of time on TikTok, although I know there's some wonderful things going on because people tell me about them all the time. Karen asks, do I have a list of books to be written and how many are on it? Oh my God, Karen, yes, I absolutely do. Uh, how many are on it? I would say without actually doing a count out loud, it's probably around 10 at the moment. Um, there are books that have been written that need to be rewritten. And then if I write that and publish it, there will be other books that go with that. So that the dark, the dark series I'm always talking about in the Chirrup, um, that's in that camp. So that's three books alone. Uh, there's the follow up to the Tinkered Stars. There's the second book in the Crudrat series. I'm sorry. I know I will write it eventually. Uh, those are both sci fi's though. Sci fi's just don't work as well for me. Um, but, you know, I want to write them. There's at least two claw and courtships. There's possibly more delightfully deadlies. You know, there's other characters like Felix that I'd really like to write. So, you know, there's lots, there's lots of options. Um, so yeah, there's at least 10 um, without me having to really try and figure it all out and count. And then there's nonfictions that I want to write as well. Um, more questions from above. Any possibility of signing at the writing seminar in Anaheim at the end of July? Ah, so I'm going down to LA uh, to teach a seminar. If you are attending the seminar, I can absolutely sign your book but I hadn't planned on organizing like an LA thing. The LA venues are strange. I do have access to a venue, but it's nowhere near Anaheim. And if you're not near where you are in LA, that means you're an hour away from it and I don't have a car and there's no real good public transport in that part of the world. So 
I hadn't intend on it uh, because I was just planning on just going down there and doing this thing and seeing a couple of friends and maybe taking some meetings with, oh, I don't know, the people who have the film option for my books. But um, but I hadn't planned on doing an event. Honestly, like L.A. just has a pretty bad reputation um, for people coming to st events, like coming out and seeing you in person. It's kind of an insular part of the world. New York as well has a very bad reputation for this. But, you know, if you guys let me know, you type back to the chair or whatever. And let me know if you think an L.A. thing would work. I can try to organize something of an, and it would be like during the week in the evening though so you know traffic oh yeah it's a possibility though I'm, I'm not against it um oh i've lost lost the post boop, 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 boop. um how about parasol books set in australia i tend to like to set my books places that i'm very familiar with so places that i've lived or places i've traveled to regularly um, and I haven't, I've only been to Australia once, so I don't know very much about it. And I just would be scared of um, messing too much up if I said anything there. But it's a cool idea. Do I have a favorite character to write? Well, I've talked about the fact that I really like the characters that are easy to write. So Lord Akeldama is always easy to write. Whenever he comes on screen, I'm like, oh, great. This is going to be not a problem for me. <laughs> We're just going to write this. Um, so those are my, those are my favorite um those are my <laughs> my favorite characters to write, frankly, are the ones that aren't too difficult. Um, what about middle grade with pictures? Uh, well, uh, the problem with pictures is you have to sub... I'm not an artist, so I would have to... Silvana, who is an artist, is asking this question. I would have to subcontract to do that. Um, and that just means you're waiting on the other talent. So a thing that is already delayed by me is also delayed by somebody else. So that is why I've never done picture books or anything in that arena. The illustrated edition of Solace was handled by my publisher and they contracted with the artist and everything. So, I mean, it's enough problems trying to get an artwork for the cover, let alone like multiple pieces of artwork for a, for a book of some kind. So also on the subject of middle grade, I find it the most challenging of any genre to write. So I personally, have mad respect for anybody who writes middle grade and really don't want to do it myself. Um, so I just think it's so hard to get right. Um, and I don't know that I have the talent for it. Scanning through for questions. Rune asks, there are crochet parasol patterns. Oh yes, there are there's some great crochet pa parasol patterns. I've seen multiples of them. It's really cool. But then you have to try and fit it onto the frame everybody's more crafty than me i i'm just it just seems very fiddly but i've seen some of them and they're beautiful um lynn asks uh what exactly does a developmental editor do oh no that's not a stupid question at all uh i, I speak about the background of writing because it's my whole career and it's what i do but i and I forget that readers don't necessarily know the right, the, the right, the terms that we authors bandy about. Um, so generally speaking, there are multiple different kinds of editors out in the world. A developmental editor actually works on the story structure itself. So scenes like whether the scenes, things like whether the scene is cohesive, whether it's conveying the information that needs to be conveyed, character consistency, plot and story arc, and broad picture things like whether that book suits the genre. So a developmental editor really works with you on the craft end of um, scripting the story and the book itself, as opposed to somebody like a copy editor or a line editor who's looking for typos and you know misspelled words and things like that. Um, so even though I have, you know, 32, 36, a lot of books written at this juncture, I actually still like to use a developmental editor. I usually don't need a very heavy dev pass myself because I've got it down. I, I know what I'm doing at this juncture. Um, <clears throat> but I do find that a good dev editor always adds to the quality and kind of the tightness and the consistency. And because I'm a pretty kind of breezy, writer in my style and because i tend to be sort of on the comedy of manners end of the spectrum 
the pacing of my books is something that very much concerns me and a developmental editor can help me stay on track and keep you guys as readers engaged. So um, I, I tend to like a dev edit pass, even though there are authors uh, who are um, independently and self-published and have written as much as I have that don't bother with a dev editor anymore. Um, it's kind of take it or leave it. I do think a dev editor is something that authors early on in their career really usually do need and benefit from. You learn a lot from a dev edit and I like to keep learning. I don't I don't want to ever stop learning or get lackadaisical about this or my career or anything. So that's why I and I lost my dev editor because she just decided she wasn't going to do it anymore, uh, which means I have to try to find a new one. And the problem is with a dev editor, you need somebody who really kind of knows your style and knows how to work with you. So, it's, so there's almost like a training process for the editor as well <laughs> as for the author. And my next book that's up for would be up for editing is the fourth one in the series. So the dev editor would have to go back and read all of the previous books in the series to get familiar with the universe. So it's kind of like a big buy in for the editor. So that's why I'm kind of <sighs> not sure about that. Contract workers are always like, I find somebody who suits me and then they decide to leave the industry and I'm shooketh, very torn because I like the people I like working with and then they leave me. Ah. So that's what a dev editor does. Um, then there's line editors, then there's other other kinds like beta readers and sensitivity readers. Um, and then there's also something called a proof edit, which is like the final edit pass. So there's lots of different kinds. The devs, devs are devs are the real, you have to really be trained to be a dev editor. You need to have to really have a specific eye for editing. That's not getting caught by detail. That's one of the key. A dev editor can't really be distracted by details. They need to be, keep the big picture in mind. Uh, <laughs> Those of you unfamiliar with my lives, I make funny noises while I'm scanning the comments for question marks. Um, okay, so that was the dev editor question. I'm scanning through. Um, how's Lily? Lily Pucci, she's great. Uh, she's awesome. Uh, this is my cat, my tiny, my tiny tuxedo cat. Um, Lily puts a last name is why is your cat so small? Because everybody who meets her in real life is like, why is your cat so small? Because she's like seven pounds of cat. She's very concentrated, very tiny, very bossy. Um, but she's great. Just bucketing along. She's getting old. You know, her voice is getting croakier and croakier and she doesn't retract her claws as well as she used to. Um, but she's delighted that the rains have paused for a bit and there were sunbeams. Uh, she loves a sunbeam like most cats do. But uh, but Lily will like find a sunbeam and then summon you with various cooing and chirpy noises because she would like the human to come appreciate the sunbeam with her. Um, so there's little Lilliput worshipping and Sunbeam Appreciation Societies that occur um, in the mornings when it's sunny. So she's very excited that the rains have stopped for a bit because it's time for a reconvening of Sunbeam Appreciation Society. Uh, Fran asked when the Anaheim event is. It is. It's not really officially announced yet. Like there isn't a website for me to point people at. So I don't I don't have in the official announcement. I could click away and look for it, but it's a ways away. I think it is in... July? It's it's in the summer, so it's still a ways away, the, that Anaheim event. I'm talking about it because I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. I don't think they're going to back out at this juncture, but like I don't have my air ticket or hotel booking or anything yet, so I don't, I don't want to make promises on the back of other people's organizational capacities because, well, you know how it goes, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, so nothing's set in stone yet, so I haven't really put it onto my event schedule or anything until I, I know for sure what, what's going on. Uh, Lavender asks, any thoughts on the Brando Sando negotiations with Audible or the sketchiness on Spotify? Ooh, oh, we got weedy. Um, I don't know what the Brando Sando thing is. Uh, I mean, or I do, but I don't know it by that name. Uh, in terms of Spotify, I took my stuff off. So um, I think this was in the last cheer up or maybe the cheer up before I talked about this um, where uh, so my books were on wide distribution via Findaway Voices, which is irrelevant to the fact that that was actually Spotify. And then Spotify changed their terms of service for this is for audiobooks in particular. And so this is another thing that happened to the this Divinity books. Everything has happened to those poor books. Um, so Divinity 36 was on wide distribution, which means you could get the audiobook everywhere. 
Uh, and then Spotify changed its terms of service that included AI scraping and a bunch of other like insidious things that essentially are designed to take advantage of the author. Shocker. Uh, so I took Divinity 36 out of distribution and it's slowly cycling back. So if you had it on a platform and you see it, it's not there anymore, that's what's going on. Um, don't worry, it remains on Audible and Apple, I hope. Uh, definitely still audible and you can always get it directly from me so don't worry about that the other two demigog 12 and dome 6 will be under back under um exclusive distribution so they're going to be back and you can get it directly from me for a limited amount of time before it goes up to amazon and then once it's on amazon it's on them and apple pretty much only and nowhere else and that's just because those are the options i'm being given frankly I also want to test what it's like. So something that Amazon offers to authors is two models for distributing audiobooks, an exclusive model where we get a larger cut. We still don't get very much of the money. We get 40%, everybody. Um, Amazon takes a whopping 60 for the privilege of hosting our audiobooks. Um, and then they also distribute it to Apple. So that's how it's, it's actually getting to Apple via Amazon. And then we are paid for both via Amazon. Um, and then the other distribution model is non-exclusive, which is like 20%, but you can take it everywhere else. So I had planned to do the Tinker Star Song books as broad as possible and take it everywhere else. And then this thing with Spotify went down. So now I'm back to the exclusive model because it makes me more money, but also because I want to see how the behave, how Amazon's algorithms treat the first book in the series, which is still not exclusive against the other books in the series, which will be exclusive because what they Amazon tends to do is throttle the exposure on the books that are not exclusive to them. They're they're they they punish you for not being exclusive to them. Let's be fair. Um, and so I'm interested, but but this is the second and third book that I think they're probably going to promo a bit more. And those should sell the first one because so I'm interested. I'm, I'm playing a game with Amazon is what, what we're talking about. Um, and that was way more nitty gritty than you really needed. But there it is. Um, I'm using these audiobooks to play a game because I'm in trouble with them anyway because of Spotify. So whatever. Let's let's see what happens. It's going to be interesting times. Um, you know me. I'll just do do it. Do what I want to do and see what happens and take the consequences. Um, Ellen asks any deleted scenes that I wish I'd been able to keep in. Actually, the um, Dear Lord Akeldama, um and the Parasol vs. Ephemera book, which is an exclusive to the newsletter, um, which is just a compilation of the Dear Lord Akeldama advice columns and a few other things. Um, that book has delete has all deleted the deleted scenes from the Parasol verse in it. So you can see and read all of the deleted scenes that I maybe wish had been kept in, um, but we're not kept in. So they're all in that book so that you can actually read them all. Uh, they're also published in various places on my blog. So you, you don't have to buy the book. You can actually read them elsewhere. But yeah, I actually show you guys the deleted scenes from that universe in particular, because that's a traditionally published universe. And so, or at least most of it is. And so they, um, they take stuff out and, and I can't really contest it because they own the rights to those books. So they can do what they wish with them, including delete things from them. So, but, but I can put them up on my blog because I wrote them. So I want to share them. Um, and some of them were, so, were not usable in other books or in other content or whatever. They're very specific to that book. So I just, I just post them up for everybody to read. So that's the answer to the deleted scenes. As for my own stuff, when it's like indie published stuff and I'm doing a dev edit pass or whatever, uh, I usually um, keep those to repurpose. It's often like descriptions of things like the pack house or whatever, which could be used in another book or could be made funnier or could be rewritten. Um, but I'm at the point now where if I'm deleting something myself from a book, it means it's not meant to be in there. It's just not good. It's not good enough. It's not right. It's distracting or it's boring. So that's why it's getting cut. So I don't want to, I'm not going to share that. I'm not going to keep it usually. Um, whole drafts of other books and things that I've written 
that I've put aside or put on layaway, those of course I keep because I might, might get use of them, but but scenes, yeah. The other thing is, um, this is still answering, answering Ellen's question, is I'm a bare bones author, which means I tend to underwrite rather than overwrite. Now, most writers are actually overwriters. Most of us write too much and then we have to cut. I actually tend to write too little and then I have to add. Um, my natural word count is something on the order of 80,000 words, which tends to be too short for an adult book, an adult length book. Right. So the adult market, not the mature, not the mature X rated market, um, which tend to be 90 to 120. That's kind of the, a length for genre fiction. So, yeah, so I tend to have to add stuff in. I, I very rarely have to delete very much from my stuff. Um, it's usually the opposite for me. And that's just because of the style of writer that I am. I'm a pretty tight writer, um, partly because I write from outlines. So that helps a lot. Uh, okay, I see what's happening. Every time I click into the comments to scroll, um, I, it moves me to a different part of the comment thread. Um, yes, uh, somebody says that they love that I still use editors and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you appreciate that. It's expensive and it's time consuming, but I really like it. And, and I agree that there are a lot of authors who give up getting properly edited perhaps sooner than they should. Uh, everybody, so some people have to leave. We're, we still have a couple of minutes, so I'm still answering some questions. Cats are solar powered. Yes, they are. Can I talk a little bit more about movie options? Sure. Um, I've had four or five at this juncture for different kinds. So I tend to take, um, so there are kind of two ways you can approach movie options when you're in a position to have people wanting to option your work. You can either sell broad spectrum for more money or smaller for less money. And that is the tactic I tend to take. In other words, I tend to sell pretty restrictive movie option rights. So rather than just giving it to somebody and being like, make whatever you can of it, go to. I tend to sell it to a company that's like, we would like to make an animated series for TV. So the rights that they are buying for that option are very small. They're buying animation rights for streaming or television, as a, which means that someone else could option the movie rights, the live action television rights, and the et cetera, the Broadway musical rights, whatever. So that's tend to be the tactic that I have undertaken. So I've had different kinds of options. And my most recent one is an animation option for, for streaming or television. So series, animated series. And that's the one I'm currently in. Generally speaking, Excuse me. For film options, you need a film agent, and I also have an entertainment lawyer whom I adore, who has actually helped me out of various legal pickles over the years, so he's been great. Um, so you have a whole additional team that's helping you with Hollywood, um, as well as your literary agent and your literary team, and usually, at least in my case, my literary agent is actually interfacing with them more than I am. Uh, but it's still I still have essentially what amounts to a film agent who is responsible for pitching all of my books, theoretically. Generally speaking, film agents are a little bit different from uh, career author agents in that they just take on the one book or the one project that they think will actually sell. And they're not very interested in pimping your other stuff, which is a little sad. But yeah, so when I go down to L.A., it sort of pays to have it always pays to have FaceTime, especially in a place like L.A right? Where if I'm going to be done there anyway, I should meet with any one of my team who's interested in meeting with me. Sometimes the teams don't want to meet with the author. Sometimes they're not interested in us at all. Fair. Um, sometimes we have terrible ideas about what will work or not work. And sometimes we just waste time. So, but I will usually, if I'm, if I'm going down to LA, which is not un, uncommon for me, since it's not very far away for me, it's just a very short plane ride or a long drive. Um, I'll usually let my film agent know and Wayne, my my ET lawyer and a couple of other people down. And if I have an option, I'll let the I'll let the people who own the option know that I'm going to be down there, partly because it reminds them that I exist. It reminds them that they optioned this project, that they maybe should be pursuing it. Um, so, yeah, that's it's it's just you play the game networking wise. And, and that's mostly what Hollywood is. <clears throat> oh, Beth Brando Sando is Brandon Sanderson trying to negotiate for better audiobook rights for indie authors on Amazon. His, his leveraging. Yeah, I don't see 
I don't see Amazon changing their policies ever for anybody, not even Brandon Sanderson. Um, they don't really have any reason to do so um, at this juncture in particular. So, uh, doo -doo -doo. The Amazon exclusive um, audiobook deal is for seven years technically, um, they'll just keep redoing it if you don't actually say at seven years, hey, I'd like the rights back to my book. But they actually in instituted a new thing where you can you can request a reversion. Um, and considering that Audible doesn't really promote backlist very much, it might be worthwhile to request the reversion if there were a legitimate alternative to Audible, which with Spotify doing what Spotify is currently doing, we've lost our one legitimate alternative for audiobook distribution. So that's where we are right now. Patrick is very kindly explaining things to people in the comments on how it works. The nitty gritty of how little we authors actually get off the face price of a digital print or audio edition is pretty abysmal because what a lot of readers don't realize is that all of these providers or many of them also charge distribution fees, which are, you know, pennies, but they're coming out of your royalties. So, for example, Amazon charges to deliver the digital editions. They charge us. They don't charge you. Right. So, you know, so that gets taken off your royalty. And then there's all these other ways. And also, you know, we're paid off of net, not gross. And, you know, there's all these other ways that they just nickel and dime and nickel and dime and nickel and dime until what you're making off of each individual sale of a book is, you know, pretty much impossible to make a living that way. Um, which is one of the reasons that I set up doing direct sales so much and which I ask you guys to buy from me that way so frequently because much larger percentage of the money actually goes into my pocket for the book itself. Um, Alan asks, would, would I ever produce like Neil Gaiman with Good Omens? No, I, I don't have that kind of money. <laughs> um, I can't produce my own stuff. That's millions of dollars. Um, I just had to buy a mobile home for my father. Like, <laughs> that's most of my savings, everybody. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't, I, no. Also, like, I'm just not, I'm not one of those authors who's super invested in Hollywood. Like, I don't mean to break it to you, but, like, I write books because I like reading books. Like, yes, I like watching dramas and stuff like that, but, like, I write the medium I write and I'm involved in it, not because I want to be a script writer, but because I want to be a writer writer. Like I write writing things. I like writing lots of words on pages. Um, so yeah, so I'm just not really invested in getting my stuff distributed or into Hollywood. I mean, I understand that it can have a great impact on one's career or, or whatever, but um, it's never been an end game for me personally. I've always been one of those authors who's like, oh, would you like to option my stuff? Cool, don't fuck it up, um, which that, that, part has caused me problems in the past, but um, you're not allowed to do that. Uh, I don't like straight washing and I don't like whitewashing and my, I don't want you to do that to my stuff. And that's, that's I've gone up against studios because of that. But uh, apart from that, I'm like, yeah, you want to adapt it into something? Sure. Give it a try. See what happens. Um, I'm not, I'm not super precious about my work. I've never been precious about any other adaptation. I wasn't precious about the graphic novel adaptations. I wasn't particularly precious about the audiobook adaptations when they originally happened because I didn't have much control over who was going to be chosen as the reader or anything like that. You just have to let your publisher do what they're going to do. Um, so yeah, if you want, if you want me on the page, if you want to know what the original is like, you read the book. That's 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 what I wrote. <laughs> that's the medium I chose. So yeah. Um, <laughs> Patrick, <laughs> it's okay, Patrick. You're fine. Don't worry about it. Um, have I put any books on Chirp? So Chirp has to be reached by used to have to be reached by Find a Way, which was Spotify. I think you can go in direct, but I think they require you to sign up for some other service. Um, originally, Chirp was a freebie distribution model, so they also charged the authors early on. Because <laughs> if you want to give away something for free, you also have to pay to do it. Um, anyway. 
<sighs> so no, I'm not on Chirp. I don't know about Chirp. I don't, I'm not seeing much. I, I also would like to see data and statistics. So I like to participate in platforms that show me what's going on at the back end so I can make educated decisions. And so far, I don't know if Chirp is at all effective because guess what? I haven't seen any data on it. <laughs> So yeah, oh, we're getting so weedy. We're supposed to be silly and fun and we're talking about distribution issues. Um, oh, this is an interesting one. So Lavender asks if there's, if um, Lavender uses a digital credit for ship for shipping or what have you, is there a, who is providing the discount? It depends. It depends on what platform you're using to purchase on. Generally speaking, generally speaking, um, something like a shipping discount or a gold box sale or something that the platform is doing, the author is still going to make the same royalty. If the author has slashed the price, so say I decide to put a book on sale for a buck ninety nine or ninety nine cents or something like that, then it's coming out of my cut. So um, I am taking a much I'm taking the, the I'm not getting the full royalty. I'm getting the percentage off of that smaller number. And again, anything under a buck ninety nine, it's an even small. It's like a thirty percent. So you you know I'm making pennies on if I do a ninety nine cent deal, which is why I very rarely do them, <laughs> um, except via the newsletter. So um, yeah. Uh, so the answer is there's no simple answer, Lavender. I'm sorry. It really depends. Um, but sometimes you'll see authors get up in arms because a platform has decided to arbitrarily discount their book without telling them and then pay them less for it. And that that is that should not be allowed. And in many countries, it is not allowed. There's a word for it. I don't remember what it is, but we should we should be allowed to dictate the cover price of our own books and the vendor should not be discounting that cover price um, and then taking it out of our cut, their choice to put that thing on sale. That's not that's not in their terms of service. So, um, yeah. How do audiobooks end up in libraries? Because I know Amazon doesn't do it. Uh, yeah. So uh, that, again, depends on what app your library uses. So that was the big one. That's the big one that really disappointed us with having to leave Spotify and find away voices because that was one of the main ways to get into libraries. I also have a Kobo beta account. Basically, that just means I can upload my audiobooks to Kobo and Kobo can distribute them to OverDrive and Libby. So if your library has either OverDrive or Libby, which are the same thing, um, then you can get many of my audiobooks that way. Um, but the answer is uh, often audiobooks can't get into libraries because of this, and it's worse now um, since this recent situation. It's there's no the, uh, libraries themselves don't really offer direct portals to us indie uh, independently producing authors so i can't just upload it to the library system unfortunately oh rachel's saying thank you for me to be an author well i'm stuck now i mean what else am i good for um <laughs> no thank you um it, it's a struggle but honestly I always say this when I'm teaching about the writing industry to people, but um, this is the way I think about publishing, which is uh, when I was learning how to ride a motorcycle, and I used to be a motorcycle rider for a very long time, The my teacher used to say, look, here's the thing about riding a motorcycle. Everyone else on the road is out to kill you, and there's no point in getting upset about it. The point is to just be as defensive as possible so that you can protect yourself as much as possible when you're on a bike. and if somebody accidentally doesn't see you, moves into your lane, does all of these things that motorcycle riders deal with, they're just doing their job because their job is to try to kill you. Um, and that's kind of how I feel about the vendors, particularly in the publishing world. Their job is to make as much money as possible off of my books. They're just doing their job. There's no point in me getting upset about it. Um, they're gonna try to work the system as much as possible to take advantage of me and my creative endeavors as much as possible. And what I have to do is just defend myself and fight the good fight and stay as informed as I can and do things, unfortunately, like pull out of 
find away voices and Shopify when it's become quite clear that they're going to push it further than I'm willing and that I will be taking a financial hit because of that. But I'm just not there. There comes a, I do have lines that I have drawn where I'm like, yeah, you're trying to kill me a little too much at this juncture. So I'm going to get off the motorcycle and go away and ride somewhere else for a while. Um, but at this point in my career, after 15 years, I'm pretty sanguine about it, right? I've been through the ringer. I've had all of these things that happen to authors happen. I've had accounts canceled. I've been dropped by publishing houses. I've been dropped by editors. Like, I just know the drill. It doesn't upset me the way it does other author authors as much. Um, I mean, it's still, it's a bit annoying, but the way I reconcile myself with it is simply, they're just doing their job. And, uh, and I have to keep doing mine and try to get the books out to you guys as best I can um, in this wild world. Oh, we did the jumpy jumpy thing in the comments again. Thank you, Facebook. Uh, yet another devil we deal with. Questions, questions, questions. Will more of your books be translated into French? Ah, so this is a question that you have to ask the French publishers. Um, People trans, I get translated when someone asks for translation rights. So I don't do my own translations. I maybe could, but um, but yeah, it's not worth it. <laughs> so I don't know how else to put it, except France in particular is still primarily a print market, which means uh, it's practically impossible to break into from the indie perspective, which means a French publisher has to pick up my books, translate them, and then distribute them. Uh, it's just too expensive for me to do it myself uh, because my ability to reach readers in France is so limited, is particularly limited um, if I tried to do it by myself. I, I have to have help. Um, and that's not even accounting for how incredibly expensive it is for a translation itself. So things like, people don't understand this, but the numbers game isn't great, but things like translations and adaptations, like audiobooks and things like this, we're talking thousands of dollars. We're not talking hundreds here. Like to get a professional to really translate well one of my historical books or historical set pieces in particular is a lot of money. Um, and sometimes there's not enough of you who, who are interested in that kind of book um, in that territory in that that language in that part of the world so yeah i'm sorry france uh but that that is a question you need to write to french publishers and be like you should publish gail Carriger. like why don't you keep publishing her uh because they don't listen to us publishers they never listen to authors they only ever listen to readers um so you guys have the power in that particular instance which is to squeaky wheel at publishing houses until they pick up the authors for translation that you want picked up um yeah have i watched blue-eyed samurai on netflix oh my god you're like the millionth person to ask me that question uh no but i should shouldn't i uh, i see that we're running towards the end of the live so i'm gonna blow through the final questions oh my god why do you hate me <laughs> i know i know i should watch blue-eyed samurai uh it's just yes i know okay i will it's just there's other stuff to watch that's all is that our last question? Is somebody going crazy on Blue White Samurai? Um, Patrick, you could just go crazy on Blue White Samurai on your own podcast. You don't need to do it here in my life. Ah, uh, Karen asks, how much does an audiobook ask me? Uh, how much does an audiobook cost me to publish? Um, yeah, it's about a full length book is about three thousand dollars for me, all told. Now, I also I use a producer because I don't like to listen to my own audio and QA it. Um, I think that's as close to torture as I would come. I just I weirdly can't stand listening to other people read my stuff. Uh, I don't know why, I just can't do it. Um, so I have to pay somebody to listen to Quality Assure that it's good in good working order as well. And he also like finagles the audio, make sure the balance is good, make sure um, all the words are said the same way. So um, yeah, so I pay both for the narrator to do it and then I pay for a producer to do it. So that's why mine are particularly expensive, but yeah, it's about $3,000 or more. Um, for each book. So that's how much audiobooks cost everybody. <laughs> so, so buy the audiobooks, please. Like, listen to the audiobooks. Um, because, man, uh, 
it's becoming like I, I'm at the point where I maybe will break even. I'm not even sure if I will on these next ones because boy, are they expensive. There's a reason that AI in audio is up and coming so quickly. And partly that's because it's so expensive to do an audiobook that for some, for many, many authors, AI is the only option we have. It's either AI audio or no audio at all, because it's just too expensive. And I get it. I understand why things cost what they cost. A good narrator is expensive and should be, but it's prohibitively expensive for a lot of authors out there. All right, we're gonna do um, the very last question. Um, which is, I know a lot of people know your books um, here in France, sadly, um, but he talked about, oh, thank you very much. I do appreciate like French readers and French readers support. Um, I wish it were easier to publish in translation. Um, I really, really do. And I know there, and the, uh, you know, there are some countries where like the books, my books in translation stopped halfway through with the series and stuff like that. It's so sad to me. I am looking into translation, but most of those, tr most of the translations that I'm looking into doing will be for my my indie projects. So it'll be for for the not Parasol verse series is the spinoffs like the Delightfully Deadly and stuff like that. And you know, but I am looking into it because there are some like people coming into the fray to wholesale handle multiples. So I am looking into more translations. So maybe maybe we will get France in the docket. Maybe fingers crossed, everybody. Um, thank you all for tuning in. We got very weedy. I'm sorry about that. Um, but uh, but I appreciate all of you sticking with me and saying hi and asking lots of interesting questions. And I promise to be a little bit more focused next time. Um, let me know if there's anything you specifically want a live on. If there's a topic you want me to focus on, you can always leave a comment with the ideas for that. If you want me to like focus on one specific thing for a while. Um, It'll be a little less disjointed, <laughs> at least for half of the live. Otherwise, I'll see you next time. I am pl planning on doing one in April, so we'll talk to you all in April. And have lovely springs, and I hope your lives calm down a little bit, um, and that you have lots of yummy things to eat and delicious tea to drink, and I will see you next time. Bye. Ooh, how do I end it? <laughs>